Good evening, my name is Kafri Dross. I'm a physician and a scientist at Duke University. Rather than begin by telling you about all the amazing progress we've made in neuroscience, I thought I'd start off by telling you about one of my experiences that really motivated the work we do in the lab and perhaps highlight some of the challenges we have as physicians, scientists, and researchers in really healing patients and their families of some of these illnesses we've tried to overcome. After my two years of inpatient psychiatric training at Duke and one year of outpatient training, I realized that one of the major challenges we had was transitioning people from the inpatient services to the outpatient services. This was particularly most poignant when we were thinking about those suffering from what we would call new onset disease. This is their first experience. Folks typically who would be in their late teens and um, early 20s. So I went to my program director. I, I'm a researcher, so I wanted to do an experiment. I wanted to see if it would be possible for us to set up a transition clinic where we can really smoothen out that process and make sure folks are able to stay on their meds. So she agreed to let me do this experiment. Um, I went in and one of my first patients, uh, I'll say his name is M, for the sake of maintaining his confidentiality. Sometimes I'll change ages a little bit, genders a little bit, and definitely initials, but this is a, a real person. And so when I met M, I heard a little bit about M's story. So M was a, a senior in college. He went to college to study pharmacology. He got into his senior year and applied for this really competitive internship. It took about six months to apply for the internship. He was one of the five people who got this internship at a local uh, pharmaceutical company. And this internship, they would bring five people in, five interns, and they would essentially compete for a semester for six months. And at the end of this competition, they would invite one person, and they would hire them and give them the job. So M uh, was selected as one of these five interns. He started working really hard. He said this is the most stressed he'd ever been. <clears throat> Over the course of the six months, his sleep got a little bit disrupted. He started noticing he had problems concentrating his work at work, and his mom and his girlfriend would say his, his emotions started getting a little bit erratic. Near, near the end of the six months, his, his mom finally just decided she had to bring him to the hospital. They were walking at Whole Foods, and he started having these experiences where he was looking around the corner and he thought the FBI was watching him. So he ended up on the inpatient psychiatric unit. They diagnosed him at the time with what they thought was bipolar disorder, the psychotic features, and started him on two medications. One was an antipsychotic risperdal, the other one was lithium. And I saw him after he'd been there for about 12 days as they were getting ready to transition him out of the inpatient unit. So I sat down and I, I talked to him and his mom and he said, look, the most important thing is I've, I've got to get back to this internship. A week before he came to the hospital, he figured out he'd been selected as the one person who was going to get invited to join the company. So he said, I've got to get back there. You know, the timing worked out OK, so I can tell them this is a vacation. But I've got to get back there as soon as possible. He said, Doctor, you've got to understand, this is my first job. right? I've been working for this. This is why I went to school. And he said his goal was to get back as soon as possible. Now, I cautioned him. right? These medications are extremely powerful. They come along with some really troubling side effects. And, 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 and the main concern for me at that point in time, thinking about these illnesses, these psychotic disorders, is they can have lifelong courses if you aren't able to stay on your medication early on. So you can have decreases in cognitive function that can, that can stay with you. But he was really insistent that he had to go back to work, his mother agreed. And my job was to transition him out of the hospital. And so we agreed to do that, but I would get to see him four days later. So he shows up to the clinic four days later, and he says, doctor, there's a problem. Right? These medications you have me on, right? I, like, I can't concentrate and I can't think. Right? They have me like just moving a little bit slower than everybody at work, and I'm worried that people are going to notice. So I've got to stop these medications. Now, me as a psychiatrist, I said, no, nah, that's probably a bad idea. Right? I'm like pulling out the literature. I'm trying to explain it to him. I'm walking through with his mom. I'm on up to date. I'm giving him access to information. I'm trying to connect him with the local NAMI chapter. And, and like he and his mom just stop me, looks at me, and says, look, I, like, I I know you're a doctor, right? I know you've been in school for however long, but I don't think you really get it. I've been working for this job for the last four years, and now I have it, right? It's, a, it's the one thing that I want. I want this job. And I know you're talking about all this like lifelong stuff, but if I don't have this job, I'll have nothing to do, and I'll have nothing to live for. What is the point of living with this mental illness if I can't work, right? This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm here for. And he stopped and he paused and he looked at me and he looked at his mom and we all got silent in the room. <clears throat> and what he was saying was, doctor, like, I'm stuck, right? On the one hand, like, I completely recognize that I have this illness that I need to take seriously and I need to think about. But if I treat this illness, the medications are going to do something that ruins my life. 
right? And for me at that point in time, I like to walk through the medications and walk through symptoms. But you know what? He was right. I knew the medications would make his mind slower. In fact, that's actually what they're supposed to do. It's why they work. The problem is, the side effect is that they were making his mind slower. He wasn't thinking as fast as he was. In fact, he was moving significantly slower. He was having some problems dreaming, right? These were real and living problems. And what he was saying was, he was stuck. And I got it. And I didn't just get it because I'd spent the last six or seven years in school learning to become a psychiatrist. I got it because these, these experiences were truly intimate to who I was as a human being. And, and I'd seen them in my family as well. And one of my siblings, there's, there's five siblings, four of them have depression, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. In, in fact, one of those siblings has, one has bipolar disorder. He himself is a professor, and he struggles with the same things with his medications. With, when he takes them, they make his mind go too, too slow to work. So I understood exactly what this young man was talking about. So, so as Victoria talked about, we've got this organ, right? We've got all these cells in this organ called these neurons, right? And, and we've got all these amazing scientific things happen. The question becomes, why am I sitting there and I have nothing to offer this young man when he's presenting me with something that I understand is real, I understand he needs his medications, but I also understand his stuff. So the brain is an organ. It's, it's, it's small enough to fit in the palms of both your hands. It's got about 80 billion cells that we call neurons, another 80 billion cells. And some say it's critically important, others say it supports those 80 billion neurons. But what is known is who we are as human beings, right, is locked within that organ and the interaction of those cells with one another. Right? It's the first thing when we wake up in the morning, it's the, it's the smell of fresh coffee when we walk down the stairs, when we, when we nudge our little kids to get up and get ready for school. It's us remembering how to drive to work, the motor behavior that allows us to drive the car, that, that which allows us to do work and come home at the end of the day and remember how to get there. All of that is locked into this little organ we call the brain. And so it's in there, right? It's like Prego says, it's in there, right? We gotta know how to go after this, but here's the problem. So if, if, and I'll give you an example of, of where we really struggle with how to get into this physical organ and figure out how to come up with new treatments, right? So it's called mental health tapas. If I was to ask anybody who'd like, you know, some burgers and fries, put your hands up. Or, or yeah, some nice lamb, right? Or, 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 or some steak and potatoes, right? Here's the challenge, right? As I was doing that, my mouth generates these pressure waves. These pressure waves travel through the air, strike your tympanic membrane. Through the incus stapes and malleolus, this is changed over through the kinocilium and their tip links into chemical energy. Once that chemical energy is changed into electrical energy, travels down the cochlear nerve into your superior olivary nucleus, hits your auditory thalamus, hits your auditory cortex, where it's transitioned into pitch. Then on the left side of your brain in the Wernicke's area is transitioned into these words. These words have representations that show up in your frontal cortex and your parietal cortex, and all of a sudden you see a burger fries in your head. Your motor cortex is released, that signal travels down your spinal cord, hits your muscular cutaneous, your medial nerve, your ulnar nerve, your radial nerve, your hand goes up, and all of that process happens in less than half a second. So if you have this simple process that simple as responding to a burger and fries, how much more complicated are the ideas that the government is out to get you? Right? Your ability to concentrate at work. All of that is locked within this organ. We call that processing. The idea that each of this little bit of information processing happens in different places. Distributed processing. So many parts of your brain are working together so quick that they're all one machine. It's like driving a car, right? You don't think, oh, man, I've got to make my engine go a little bit further. Man, I've got to turn the wheel. It all happens at one time. And that's how the brain operates. So I started to think about the brain in this way. I was an engineer by background. I was a chemical engineer in nature. And I heard about this guy at Duke who was doing this amazing work. His goal was to rebuild body parts and wire them up into the brain. And so I heard about this work. He had figured out how to build robotic arms and wire them directly <coughs> to a monkey's brain so that a monkey could move the robotic arm by thinking about it. It was hooked up to the sensory cortex. So if you test the robotic arm, it could generate these pulses that put the signals back in the brain. So the monkey could move, it could eat with this robotic arm. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could do something like that? for psychiatric illness. Read information out of many parts of the distributed network simultaneously, decode it, figure out where the problem was, and basically stitch the whole thing back together. So I started doing this work in, in late 2008, and we we're taking advantage of mouse models. So the primary species that we use in my lab is mice. And the reason we take advantage of these mice is because we can take candidate genes that you find in humans. So there's these huge genome studies, right? Our goal 
you know, 10, 15 years ago was to identify the gene for bipolar disorder, the gene for schizophrenia, that wasn't the case. But we find candidate genes, things that give you risk, right? So we don't have a gene for being tall or a gene for being short, but the things that give you risk for being shorter, things that give you, you know, opportunities to be tall. So we find these risk genes that we can put into mice. And, and one of the first ones in particular was a gene, it was a circadian gene. And when this became disrupted in mice, they had much less anxiety, right? They didn't sleep, and they love cocaine. <laughs> what, was, what, was, what was particularly interesting about this phenotype that showed up in mice is that if you gave them lithium, not one time, but over the course of two weeks, all of these behaviors went away. And so we were thinking about this as a model for bipolar disorder, and the question became, could we figure out where in the brain these problems were occurring? So what we do is we essentially transform a mouse into a robotic instrument. We're able to implant electrodes into the brains of these animals. We're able to record information from multiple sites simultaneously, 30,000 pieces of information per second, by implanting these wires, each the size of a piece of hair, into the mouse's brain. And this is just an example where we're able to record brain waves. These are the same things that Dr. Carpenter was showing you, these waves from the top of the skull. We're able to record the activity of each of these single neurons. This is a 3D picture showing us looking inside the animal's brain with the wires implanted. And we're able to keep these animals alive, and so we can pull these signals out of the brain as it's online in real time functioning. This is an example of what it looks like. We're able to ask ourselves what's going on in each part of the network, right? So we're not talking now just this area or this area. It's all how the network interacts. We look at the whole thing simultaneously. And now we're not only asking questions about what's happening in a brain area, but how these brain areas are interacting with each other. And we're essentially trying to find roadblocks, right? So the idea is, you know, I'm, I'm old enough, right? I'll, I'll sort of give myself away. I'm old enough that I remember after track practice, if you wanted mom to pick you up, you had to get one of those pay phones, put a quarter in, and call mom, right? And if ever there's like a storm or a problem in the area, like the phone doesn't go through, right? And the idea is when there's a disruption in the line, the call didn't go through. And now there are these wonderful things called cell phones, where it doesn't matter if there's a disruption in the line. You can get around the disruption by taking information, processing it somewhere in the air, right, on a tower, and sending it back down on the other side. Could, so can we take advantage of the same type of approach to figure out where the roadblocks are in information processing in the brain and then go around it? So that's what we're working in the lab. And, and the, the tool that we'd ultimately like to develop are things that are brain prosthetics, right? And so can we do things to supplement brain function? In, in, a, in an ideal world, we will undoubtedly have some diseases in which things like transcranial magnetic stimulation are perfect. But in others, other devices might be required. This is a, a lot like thinking about um, illnesses of the heart. In some cases, uh, antihypertensive is perfect. Uh, a cholesterol agent is perfect. But in some cases, when there's a, a loss or enough damaged tissue, a pacemaker might be the appropriate tool that's necessary to put the rhythms back into place. The same thing with thinking about hearing and cochlear devices. The question is, how can we take these engineering devices, stitch them into biology such that they work together? Now, this is, um, it, it was a crowning achievement uh, for my advisor's lab. This was last summer uh, at the World Cup, or excuse me, 2014 at the World Cup. So again, uh, this was a scientist. His goal was to rewire uh, machine body parts into the human brain. And he's a Brazilian scientist. And so he approached the Brazilian government and he said, I'd like to make a paralyzed person walk again. Now, of course, all of us in the lab, we, we used to think he was somewhat grandiose. We were like, you know, these are the, this miracle hasn't been performed in about 2,000 years, boss. <laughs> but it seems like there's something you want to try on TV. Go for it. And, and so he approached the Brazilian government and in what he called was the Walk Again Project. And his goal was to take a, a paralyzed person, build a fully robotic exoskeleton, put the paralyzed, the quadriplegic, or the, the paraplegic person in the robotic skeleton, and by thinking about it, they would walk out and kick the opening kick of the World Cup. So this is a picture. It flashed really quickly if you were watching the opening ceremony of the World Cup, because everyone was paying attention to, to J-Lo. But there are about five seconds in which they showed this scene. This is a, a paralyzed Brazilian athlete who walked out in the fully controlled exoskeleton and kicked the opening kick of the World Cup. And for me, this is an incredible moment that suggested perhaps we needed to dream really big about the treatments that we can create for mental illness, right? That we can take care, that we could we could have available to M, that would really that would really get him not stuck, right? Stuck between taking his meds and the problems that can absolutely come along with taking your meds, right? As he said, you know, what he was saying to me in that moment was, I want to live, right? I don't want to just be alive. 
I want to live. And I think that's the real responsibility that we as physicians and breeding scientists have, right? It is to put patients and their families and their lives back together. So this is the newest project that we're working on. This is, uh, it's, it's the, the culmination of some of the work we've been doing in the lab. So we have these techniques that allow us to find the roadblocks. And now we're essentially building these brain, brain pacemakers. So we have our genetic models. And the idea is we're, we're just going to take information out of the animal's brain. We can process it. This is one computer, but this really happens about three computers. Because we have to do this in real time, which means that we have to be able to decode the animal's brain, which is about 30 milliseconds or, you know, point, point well, sorry, <laughs> late night, point zero three seconds, right? So we've got to be able to do this in 30 milliseconds, decode the information and put it in the animal's, back in the animal's brain using various techniques. We can do it with electricity or some light stimulation techniques as well. So we've just finished up our first prototype model of this brain pacemaker. Um, and we're hoping to figure out how to scale that back now up into humans. All right, so, so the idea here is that by combining these engineering approaches that we have and, and the medical observations that we make in the clinic, that we can develop a new type of treatment that will really put patients and their families back together. Thank you.